Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Kerry McCusker. I am a PhD student from the University of Ulster. And I'm here today with Roisin Crawford from STEM Aware and Gareth McAleese from Go Berserk. So I would firstly like to say hello and welcome to you all. Um, it's a tremendous panel that we have here today. And I suppose the goal of today is to tease out the issues in relation to STEM, to STEAM and entrepreneurship and creativity and what it is to be learning in the 21st century. So as I mentioned, we have a wonderful panel here today who I will introduce. We have Steve Dugan. Stephen Dugan is the Director of Worldwide Education Strategy for Microsoft and his primary focus is on the use of technology to enhance teaching and learning experiences and outcomes. He was a former head of English for micro, um, he was a former head of English and he joined Microsoft 19 years ago. Yep. Okay, so Steve um, is passionately involved with education all his work in life. So we'll move on now to Sean O'Sullivan. Sean um, has invested in a hundred, over 100 companies. He founded MapInfo, which became a 200 um, million public company with over 1,000 employees worldwide. And he's credited with bringing the street map mapping to personal computers. Um, he's an advocate of STEM education, and he has funded organi organizations such as Khan Academy and Coder Dojo. We have Chantel Poulsen. Chantelle is a principal of the New Schools Venture Fund and she, is focuses, she focuses on the investment strategy and the management assistant for the organization's portfolio of ventures. Previously, Chantelle was an engineer, a senior engineer at Procter & Gamble and she is interested in leveraging technology to transform education for undeserved students. And now we'll finish with John Petto. John is a director of education at the Nerve Centre in Derry, where two of us are from, and <laughs> he supports digital creativity in schools and communities across Northern Ireland. John established Northern Ireland's first fab lab, and um, he's involved with the pioneering use of digital creative media in conflict education. And last year, John established the Moville Coder Dojo. So um, as you can see, we have a great panel here today, and um, I'm just going to now ask each of the panelists to maybe spend approximately five minutes just talking about the general area, and then we'll open up the floor for um, some discussion and questions, should you have any. Okay? Is the microphone Thank you. Thank you, Rashi. Sorry. Okay, so let's start with Sean here. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I um, there's a the title of this is is really an interesting title: STEM, STEAM, and I forget what else does it say. <laughs> STEM, STEAM, and entrepreneurship. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I I kind of hate the um, to uh, I hate the word STEAM. Um, uh, let me tell you why. Um, you know. Uh, you know, there there are kids in in Ireland that, that you know they get uh, you know whatever. What's the high score on the leaving cert? Like seven hundred or something? Six hundred, yeah. So they get their five seventies on their on their um, on their leaving cert, and that qualifies them to become a doctor, or um, you know study vet veterinary science, or uh, be uh, you know a Art, French art with uh, you know you know German literature uh, double major, um, and then it's like you're choosing between all these things which have nothing to do with each other, and yet they do make a well-rounded person. So uh, and and there's lots of opportunities for for people in each of those fields, but to say STEM and then to throw in arts in the middle, um, I believe uh, is a disservice to what you're trying to achieve it's like okay arts what is arts it's all the liberal arts really so aren't you just diluting the stem in the first place by just drawing in the a uh, so I, I kind of hate it because I think yeah we should all have arts in in our education but we should also recognize that where we're deficit in as a country is in stem and if we don't produce engineering and and mathematics in science grads then we can't have the kind of disruptive change that we need in the world that comes out of um, this disproportionate change that 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 the digital economy allows us as engineers and scientists and, cr and creative people to to create in the in the world. Not to say that there's not a place for the arts and all that, because the arts obviously there's um, there's <laughs> tremendous amount of art in every great product. You know, you look at an Apple product, you look at uh, you look even at uh, 
what's the uh, thing that my eight-year-old daughter can't stop playing all the time? Uh, the uh, the 3D world. Uh, Minecraft. Minecraft. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I keep forgetting it. You look at uh, you know uh, I ballistic squid and uh, you know uh, does anybody know Stampy Longnose and I, I ballistic squid? Yeah, hands hands raised on that. Mm -hmm. There's only two of us. <laughs> uh, the, you know, uh, a year ago they had 1,300 or, you know, no, he just broke, like a year ago he brought, broke 3,000 subscribers on YouTube. And uh, last week he's at 2.3 million after being at 2.1 million like a month ago. You know, so, the, you know, and that is just an incredibly creative person using technology as a platform to get his uh, great uh, humor and education uh, uh, out there. So it takes all kinds. But... Uh, we have a, you know, crisis uh, when it comes to creating uh, children which are educated enough to serve in a digital economy, the kind of the, uh, economy that Ireland is trying to grow. And, uh, you know, we don't have people who are ready for jobs when they graduate from the third level in Ireland because it's not competitive enough, uh, for, you know, because they're not competitive enough at the secondary level. So, uh, so what we have to say is, let's fix that problem. You know, you know, I at least in the United States, the second topic that they teach uh, beyond English, English is your first, takes up the most time in the English in, in the American school system. Um, I guess they should call it American rather than English because the English are offended with the, with the use of Americanisms. But, uh, but, you know, we, you know, the second topic is math. In Ireland, uh, math doesn't enter the first two topics. It's the it's the third topic. You know, it doesn't. So it gets a fraction of the amount of time that math gets uh, in the in the states, and the states isn't great. You know, well, let's not say that states is, the, is something to aspire to. We want to be at the top of the pack. So let's you know my I guess my opening comment on this is let's not di dilute it. Let's have great artists. Let's have great uh, you know mathematicians. But let's not throw the two terms in together they're like they're the same thing. Um, and that's, uh, and well-rounded people move society forward in every way. So, but let's get the STEM thing fixed and let's also work on our arts. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so I'm coming from a different perspective and I'm probably going to uh, agree and disagree. And, and I think you can assume that anything I disagree on, I'll be wrong on. Um, because I, I'm an English teacher, and that was my background. I spent 12 years teaching Shakespeare, the wonders of the, um, the pastoral elegy, um, Jates, you know, Keats, things I still love. Um, and then I found myself in a technology company entirely by accident. Actually, what happened was I had a younger brother who wanted to come back from London, and he gave me his resume and sent me to a graduate recruitment fair. And then around six months later, he started talking to me again when they offered me a job. <laughs> but I, I came into Microsoft again as an educator looking at that area. I was a subject matter expert on Encarta. Um, anyone remember Encarta? Yeah, yeah I loved it. Uh, most people did. And, and it became redundant, um, uh, as, as no doubt we all were at one stage. But it took me a long time working in a technology company to uh, get over the fear that one day they would expose me as a fraud. And the very first time, in fact, I turned on a PC, if people remember a thing called Windows 3.1, all this writing came up on the screen, so I was convinced I'd broken it. And I was literally ready to leave the building and, and receive my P45, because I'd only ever used an Apple Mac. And you turned it on, it had two little icons, and it all worked. Things have changed. Um, but it, it took me a long, to re a long time to realize that, that some of those designations and those barriers are unnatural. Um, that somebody who comes from the, from the arts uh, may have a part to to play, and in fact, uh, only two months ago, I wrote my first piece of software, which I was inordinately proud of. It took me a long, long time to do it because I still don't have those skills. But it, it took me a while to realize that some of the barriers we have created in our language, and I'm speaking here as an English teacher partly, are, are actually at, at the core of the problem. The reality is there's no shortage of the information or the knowledge. We talked to, to Khan Academy. Sal, Sal Khan came uh, to speak to us a couple of months ago, and, and he had some fantastic statistics. For, for instance, he pointed out that they're reaching 216 million students with 36 teachers. You think about the ability of technology to amplify the effect of a great teacher. It's just extraordinary. He also spoke to something I thought really resonated with me, and I think is, is, is key to this argument as well. He said, it has destroyed the notion of the slow learner. You know, a slow learner, you'll all be familiar with them. If you're in a typical classroom, um, you do teach a concept, they don't pick it up first time. You 
teach it again, the middle third of the class, pick it up. And then at some stage you go, I'm done now, I don't have time, I'm going to move on. And, and in a traditional classroom, a slow learner is someone who gets left behind. Uh, on Khan Academy, you're using some of those technical modalities. A slow learner is just someone who learns slowly because they can play that teacher over and over and over again and revisit that knowledge over and over again until they fill that gap in their learning and then they move on. And when we look at the challenge we have, particularly around STEM, in attracting people to it, to a degree we have to look at the language and say, what is it we're saying or what is it people are hearing which is not attracting them to it? I mean, if you look at the, 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 the facts of it, we, we know right now there are thousands of jobs in Ireland unfilled. And we have widespread graduate unemployment, we have widespread youth employment. Why aren't parents clambering for their kids to take up the places in colleges? Why are they not fighting for more math, more science in school? Why are the students themselves, particularly girls, not attractive to them? You know, why, why are they not taking up subjects which guarantee, in effect, a really happy and, in many cases, very, very comfortable future for them? And I think we need to start asking those questions fundamentally. You know, we, we can complain about the lack of uptake, we can complain about the lack of in, in, in investment and um, adherence to the key aims and objectives of STEM. But we also have to ask the question, why is it not attracting people? And one of the things that it, it struck, it took me a long time to discover was that it's creative. It's a creative art. You know, coding is creative. You know, it involves, as you say, elements of design. But you can create something where nothing existed before. And, and the closest analogy I can think of is actually poetry. You know, when you see somebody create something from nothing and which has a beauty to it and, and a purpose to it, that is a form of poetry. And, and my contribution to start would be maybe to ask the question, what are we doing wrong if we're failing to attract people to something which offers uh, such a bright future? So I'm going to pick up on a couple things. Um, so I'm coming from the US, so I have a US perspective. And yes, math is um, second and is um, very much a priority. Um, but we also have a problem in terms of teaching kids to fill roles that are going to be um, unfilled tomorrow. A lot of those roles are going to require coding. Um, and so in the US, only one, I think one in 10 schools even offer coding. So you think about all these jobs that are going to have coding and people can't even take the class when they're in high school. Um, so that's a huge problem that we're now looking at. Um, and I think there's the awareness problem of um, our schools not matching the skills that are going to be needed for the jobs of tomorrow. Um, so I'm an investor and um, I invest in education technology companies and so some of the companies that we've been recently looking at are companies who are trying to introduce these skills at a very early age. Um, so we made an investment in a company called um, Tinker and they're actually introducing coding at the third grade level. Um, really starting with just visual visual coding and just teaching kids to be creative. And again, it's all about creation. Um, I think the messaging is definitely wrong um, in the early ages, and there's a lot of stigmas around STEM. There's a lot of stigmas around engineers. Um, and as if kids are able to explore some of these skills really early on through things like Tinker, um, be it by being able to create um, you know different products uh, through coding, I think that's going to be a huge help. Um, the other thing is I'll just say from my own um, personal experience. Um, so before uh, my current life, I was an engineer. And I think part of the issue is just exposure to what an engineer can actually do. So if I think about coming up um, in school, I had no idea what engineering was. I loved math and science, but I didn't really understand how that connected to the real world. I didn't understand how I could apply those skills. Um, I thought about maybe I could be a car manufacturer, or maybe I can um, just you know sit behind a computer and code all day, but there's so much more to engineering. And part of the problem is that kids aren't exposed to what um, these different avenues that they can take. Um, so actually, I was in. Um, a class in chemistry in high school and one of our assignments was to go and go home and look at our products and write down the chemical formulas on the back of the labels so I didn't really believe that my teacher um, you know was was telling the truth about these products having chemical formulas that we were actually learning um, but went home looked at toothpaste looked at my laundry detergent and realized, wow, like this is actually what we're learning in school and actually connects to something that I use every day and it connects to the real world. And just that, that kind of aha moment um, really got me interested actually in the field of chemical engineering. Um, so I did pursue chemical engineering uh, and then went on to work for Procter & Gamble and actually design um, those products later. So I think just more exposure to those opportunities around how, how engineering in general relates back to the real life and then relates back to um, these great careers that students can have in the future. Um, 
a, another company that we just invested in is something called Nepris, and their whole premise is to basically bring industry experts into the classroom. So um, a lot of times, again, it goes back to this exposure piece. A lot of times, kids aren't exposed to what the different um, jobs are and what people do in their everyday careers, and a lot of times part of the barriers is where they live. Um, so what this tool or what this um, platform is doing is you can virtually connect to any anyone from different companies, whether it's a Google engineer, whether it's a GM engineer, whether it's someone from Frito-Lay, Procter & Gamble. Um, they will connect to the classroom, they'll talk about their job and they'll talk about how they got there. So, you know, talk about what skills was needed, what skills were needed, what education they did, um, and then how they really got interested in the role. And I think just, again, exposing students to what's really possible is pretty much the first step. Thanks. Um, and I would probably be with Steve here, would, would agree and disagree with, with what you're saying. Um, the Nerve Centre is an organisation that was started by punk musicians in the late um, 1980s, early 1990s, and developed a, two decades of experience around filmmaking and <coughs> music making, very creative outputs. And we now, as was, was said in the introduction, we're the home to, to one of Ireland's only two MIT connected fab labs. MIT could have put that fab lab anywhere. There was quite a long list of interested parties that they wanted to put one in. They chose to put one in a center of creativity and youth and digital culture because they believe that the STEAM notion, the STEAM agenda, offers a way of engaging people, reaching people that are excluded from STEM as it stands. And I, I don't think it's STEM or STEAM. I, I think, you know, it's STEM to STEAM. The two things sit side by side. What we know in Northern Ireland um, through the success through STEM, and I should couch most of what I say is coming from a, a Northern Irish perspective. That's the, the facts that I know, but I think it's pretty transferable. Young girls don't engage in STEM subjects at, at substantial numbers. People who come from the, the poorest and most excluded areas of our communities don't engage in STEM subjects through schools. Any industry moving forward that's ignoring two major sections of the community like that or not appealing to sections of the community like that is missing out on a huge talent pull for future development and future um, generations. If by bringing in arts and creativity you can improve the stickiness, the engagement, the interest of STEM as, as everybody here is saying, then I think you have to. I think that's part of the challenge. Um, what we're trying to do in our centre is actually train teachers as well as young people in how to use this technology within the Northern Irish curriculum. Everything we do is mapped into the curriculum, but we're working a project that we have, um, working with a history teacher in Northern Ireland, who's, who we've also partnered through the Fab Lab with a discovery project based here in Dublin, which is a, a massive digital heritage project, part of the Europea, Europeana collection, which is digitizing historic monuments around Europe. They've done Derry's city walls 400 years old today, or this last year as part of the plantation history of Ireland. Um, a group of young students from a school in Derry are in learning through history about the city walls, about the plantation, but the route way into that is through this 3D map of the walls. They then, they come in, they use free software, Google SketchUp, start to engage in 3D modeling, 3D mapping, start to learn the basic mathematics around that, then progress through to 3D prints of sections of the walls um, and start to create their own models. It's hands-on, collaborative, creative work. You're not consuming um, knowledge, you're creating your own knowledge through the, the hands-on dimensions of it. So a cross-curricular approach that builds in those humanities subjects, but has a, a strong STEM foundation underneath it, because it, it is the technology and the engineering that's at the heart of that project, rather than the history. That's, that's the carrot that gets them through the project. Um, I, th I think these things are, are, are really what STEAM is about for us, and even in a primary school context, um, working with primary schools around the teaching of science in the classroom. And I, I would argue, in, in terms of that sort of hands-on approach, my experience of school, science was probably the most creative subject that, that I studied because actually it was based around experimentation, doing stuff every lesson. You weren't sitting consuming words, writing stuff down. You were getting your hands dirty and really physically engaging with learning. Um, but in the primary school context, using mobile devices, which Northern Ireland has the highest level of mobile device uptake across the UK or Ireland within schools, um, as a way, using the engaging power of a mobile device to teach people how to make films, and then they can film science experiments. And actually the young people who have been barred, disengaged, disinterested in STEM, they love making films, they love doing creative stuff and getting to express themselves. So you create the film of the science experiment, which you then share back to your peers in the, in the school, can, can go beyond that. It improves communication skills, um, improves sharing of knowledge, pooling of knowledge, collaborative working, team working, all the core skills that a future industry needs. Um, and in our experience, bringing in that arts and creativity dimension to it has opened up STEM 
to new schools, new learners, new areas of schools. And, um, it's a shameless plug, but we have, if you go to futureclassrooms.org, we have a website up there which has got some video case studies of what we call STEAM projects in action in classrooms across Northern Ireland. Um, in the last year, we trained 5,000 teachers in Northern Ireland. There's only, um, I think there's 80,000 um, teachers across Northern Ireland. We, we managed to reach 5,000 of them last year in these kind of STEAM-based programs, and it is having an effect. It's having an impact um, and, and bringing new people into to STEAM. Where that progression then goes into people that, that will be doing quantum physics and proper hardcore science, um, technology, engineering and maths programs, I don't know, but I think it's a starting point and an essential starting point to getting there. And just maybe as a final point, we still have a, a situation in, in Ireland and I think probably in, in um, the Western world generally. There isn't the same stigma attached. People will quite comfortably say, if, if, if you're trying to work out a bill at the end of a, of a meal or something like that, well, I'm not very good at maths, I'm, I'm no good at maths, I can't do that. Nobody that I know would stand up and say, I, I, I can't read, you know, I can't do this. We, we do still have um, an acceptability to not being STEM-minded and to seeing STEM as for clever people or for people that aren't like me. So STEAM, I think, is a, is a route map into breaking down some of those barriers. Okay, thank you. And put our hand together just for the panellists. Thank you very much for that. Yep, I'd like to open up for questions. I'm sorry to hog it, given I had a chance to speak this morning. But Mark has said this morning, he, what was he looking for? Data scientist. What's a data scientist? I'm a stemmer and I hardly know what a data scientist is. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that could be the problem with both the kids and their parents. What course do I get my kid to do to be a data scientist? Are there many jobs in that? So we, we've too much language around the wide range of uh, career choices in STEM and part of it is explaining that, I think. Yeah. Yep. Kerry could answer that. <laughs> I'll pass it to the panelists first of all. <laughs> well, actually, I've noticed, uh, you know, I, uh, when I went to college, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and uh, it's in upstate New York. And it's, uh, you know, they really didn't have all the wide variety of different degree titles they have here. Um, but, you know, I got a degree in electrical engineering. And, um, and now, of course, they have degrees in cloud computing, right? You know, okay, so I invented the term cloud computing, as you may or may not know. So it's it, myself and George Favaloro came up with that term. And I think it's hogwash to give a degree in cloud computing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, number one, they don't probably, well, well, anyway, I don't want to go into the de depths of it, but why? You know, because in, f in 20 years' time, cloud computing will still be important, but there'll be something else that'll be the, the rage of the day. And, uh, you know, I, so I like it that my college in the United States still has an electrical engineering degree, which covers an incredible range of things. And there's a chemical engineering degree, and, the, which covers an, and computer science degree, which covers an incredible range. I don't get what, what this fascination is, and I think part of it is leaving cert uh, uh, specific, uh, whereby you can have a degree with a certain title, and therefore you can have a different qualification level that's required to hit that. So, so I think it's, we're designing the system backwards, um, and we're not designing our kids to be as broad-minded as they need to be um, in, you know, uh, you know, by just having the degree be a degree for your lifetime rather than the degree to get the job three, three, and then three years out, that, that, that's no longer relevant to what you're actually doing. Um, so, so I, I say that's my feeling on that. With regard to STEM, I believe you know I'm a strong proponent. I think of what almost everyone is saying here. Everyone's saying here is that STEM starts with creativity. You know, if you look at all the products that we have, you know the the iPads you're fooling with, your your eye watches or whatever else, your your you know the the clothing that you're wearing, the the glasses that you know everything that you do, the car you drove here. All of it needs to be designed, you know, and engineered. And there's an incredibly, incredibly creative profession, one of the most creative prof professions. And to perpetu perpetuate the myth that's, that STEM is not creative in any way is a disservice to, to what we need to, to do. I don't think it makes it any more creative to throw, you know, arts in the middle of it. That said, I, th I believe STEM plus arts is very, you know, is a great well-rounded, uh, well-rounded uh, thing to, to approach. So, 
that's, I'm, I'm sorry I, I came back to that point, but I th think it's important to say. Thanks. Yeah, ju just um, a, a further reflection. I think there, there's an educational challenge here I think you're speaking to, which is partly about language, it's also about understanding. And I think it's on several levels. It's not just a lack of understanding among parents, because we've come out of a system in which STEM was dis devalued, and we, we left school without that understanding. But also at, at teacher training level, I was fascinated to uh, an earlier conversation with, with somebody from, from um, Science Foundation Ireland about their investment in um, postgraduate research to provide that understanding at the teaching college level. So they're building advocacy at that level. So those who are teaching teachers, not just those who are teaching children, really have an understanding of STEM and an understanding of the value of it. Um, I, I live in a mixed household. Um, my wife is profoundly dyslexic, which means that anybody who's familiar with dyslexics knows that she makes me feel stupid on a daily basis um, because she has extraordinary spatial reasoning. And two of my kids are, are, have spatial reasoning, as uh, great spatial reasoning as well. They're both dyslexic. Uh, I have a, a, a niece who is doing engineering, electrical engineering in Trinity. And she's doing really well, but she, she made a fascinating comment, which I, I thought was really interesting. She said, yeah, I'm in the top ten. I'll never be in the top three because I'm not dyslexic. <laughs> and I thought, that what an extraordinary thing to do, you know, what an extraordinary thing to say. Why don't we know about this? Why don't we, as parents of dyslexics, know that there is a field of endeavour where they can shine and where they're already seen as outstanding? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, at a very base level, there is something we need to do just to help communicate and make people aware of those opportunities. Yeah, I think also it's about um, having a focus more on the approach and um, kind of the broader skill set and not these concrete individual skills. So I think engineers in general, like we've said, are creative and are problem solvers. And that can be applied in many different ways. And so, you know, I think about I have a chemical engineering degree, but I'm applying that now in the investing space. And it's taught me how to be um, analytical. It's taught me how to have good judgment. And just using those skills and applying them across different fields is what's important more than the title of the career. Okay, I'd just say my wife makes me feel stupid every day as well, and she's not dyslexic. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what wives do, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, on the job, titles side, you know, we do work in schools. We don't orientate people or orient people for specific careers. That's the school's job to do that. Um, but we firmly buy into the notion of a skills-based economy. Um, at the moment, there's a project because Derry is just finished being the first UK city of culture and to build on the legacy of that around hubs, digital entrepreneurial hubs to go in around the city. They say, well, what are the jobs that we're preparing people for? You know, who, what, what are we, and, you know, there were people in the room who will tell them what jobs they're preparing people for, but nobody, nobody knows. And my, my wife runs a very small um, software company and she's never employed a programmer straight out of college or 10 years out of college that she hasn't had to train to the purposes that she needs. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, people should get too hung up on what a job is. It's, it's the core skills around problem solving, creative thinking, collaborative working, and, and often de depressingly just work. Professionalism, discipline, mm -hmm. punctuality, communication, key skills like that. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting too as well with a quote I have here from Richard Reilly who was the Secretary of State under Clinton and it kind of sums up this panel and what you've just said John and that we're preparing students for technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems that we don't even know exist yet so I think that's a good way to close that and if there's some more questions, yep. Hi, um, Stephen McManus from Riptide Academy. Um, I, I find it quite interesting. There's lots of questions there uh, in relation to how do we attract kids to STEM or STEAM. And I'm particularly interested in that. And I think that Chantelle and John have touched on two small details there. They're incredibly important. Chantelle making reference to her attraction to engineering as the information that you were learning became contextualized. That's, I think it's an incredible thing that's being ignored by education, it's yeah. contextualization of information. And then John brought another big subject, which is cross-discipline or cross-silo. Uh, to make it student-centric, it's about removing silos from the center of it and making the experience, kind of making uh, the, the interest in the different subjects appear as a result of a project that you're working on. So uh, I would say, like it, within our program, uh, we've had kids coming from Reptide from Coder Dojo, saying, "Okay, I know how to program. I've put together an app. Um, app Store doesn't want to accept it. Um, what's missing?" I go, "Look, have you done market research? 
have you done worked in your prototyping and user experience? And suddenly they start going, yeah. And you know, so suddenly to click, ticks, things start clicking in their head, and suddenly they go to the next level. It's it's bringing things out out of silos and trying to simulate as much as possible real life that's waiting for them mm -hmm. at the end in the future. It's project based education. Yeah, and I suppose that's kind of tying into the entrepreneurship, which is also key to this panel as well. You know, there's actually like a term coined, which I'm sure you'll love, e-steam or steam with a double e that adds <laughs> oh, <we have laughs> entrepreneurship <a new> <laughs> before and actually end the steam. So I've said, <laughs> I've said this before, we're going to probably end up with the alphabet by the time all of this is done. But <laughs> yeah, so that's probably more of a comment or would you anybody like to in the panel address that? Or we'll move on because there's question. plenty of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, it's it's really. sort of a comment and echoing what Steve had. It's something that Chantelle said, and I've heard three other women say it about engineering recently in terms of that aha moment, either that brought them into engineering or brought them out of engineering. And this may have something to do with dyslexic as well, where they don't see the application of their learning. I ironically went into medicine, came out, became an art historian, and now across sectors, I'm working on a technology project for government, but I'm in education. And I think the question for all of us is how do we embed you know, as parents and as educators, that aha moment into the process. Because I think we don't know what the jobs are going to be. I know I do it with my children, I do it with anybody I meet, is to find the thing that you're passionate about, the thing that you're, that you're good at, and the jobs will come because we don't know what the jobs will come. But it's, it's I think the difficulty, as Steve said, is in the educational process about how to build in the aha moments and to let those of us who want to move from the arts into technology and technology back into the arts have that flexibility to do. I, I created those opportunities, but that's that's not everybody can do that and not everybody has the, either the confidence or the ability. So how do we create an educational process that allows the interdisciplinarity and the aha moments? So. Okay, so thank you, Rashi. So despite my electrical engineering background, my, my advanced degree is a Master of Fine Arts in Filmmaking. Uh, so, <laughs> ha. <laughs> from, from, from University of Southern California. So, uh, but, uh, so what, what scares me is that we don't have a foundation of, of STEM, uh, which is good enough. I mean, you know, I have a son, he's autistic, he's six years old, he doesn't speak. Um, and he needs, before he studies more math or anything else, he needs to get language. And, uh, you know, we're working very hard at it. He's actually, he actually has about probably 50 words. And, you know, about an 18 month year old or 18 month old baby's worth of words. So we, we, we have to get the language first. But we also have to have a foundation of math for our general children, uh, which makes them literate. Um, and makes them capable. And we have to have, in this day and age, a foundation of coding, which you call poetry, which I agree with. with. We have to have that ability to create uh, at an early, early stage. What we, you know, what I can tell you from having employed great programmers over many, many years, I've been in the software industry for programming for whatever, 38 years. Uh, so what I can tell you that the, the best d developers you'll ever get are people that were coding since at least the age of 13 or 14, uh, if not before. So when you talk about the, the risk that, w that, that we have, yeah, uh, Chantelle referred to it, you know, when, when she, the light, the, her eyes opened up, you know, w with that teacher sort of pointing out what, what made it, you know, the, the chemical composition of, of toothpaste or whatever, um, that, that light needs to open up early so that we have at least a foundation uh, a, a, a of capability. And that means the teaching methods need to make it attractive to learn um, uh, these skills, to have a base level. They may not go into, they may go into filmmaking. Like I did filmmaking for, for years. You know, they may go into something else, but they, if they're gonna be good enough at it, we cannot deny them uh, the, the math skills that they need uh, to, to, until it's too late for them to, to be adept at those skills. You cannot, you could take an architect or, you know, some, well, you can take some of the unemployed people in, in the economy and throw them at a digital retraining program, but they're never going to be, unfortunately, they're never going to have that adeptness uh, to be able to speak it like a native language, like you could if you earn it, learn it. Uh, at a young enough age, mm -hmm. so so that's what I'm afraid of if we if we don't uh, address STEM 
uh, you know, more concretely at the at the earliest stages. And just to, to, to in agreement with that, I think I think there's a strong case to say that math and science have been worst served by the outmoded modalities we've used in school, by the by rote learning environments, by the passive learning environments of all subjects. They're subjects that need children to get immersed in learning, that need to have learning by discovery, that need to celebrate failure, celebrate grit, celebrate effort. And conversely, I think they are subjects which will benefit in most from the new modalities that are approaching, from the new pedagogies that are approaching, from the new emphasis upon collaborative learning, learning by discovery. Um, but we're still missing the skill sets. I think that's, that's part of the challenge. Can I, I just wanted to add, Mathletes, uh, you know, .ie, it's current competition for all the Irish students. 3,400 kids are signed up for it. It's accessible. Like 10% 10, 10 of Irish schools are competing at this point. Uh, of the 50 top uh, students, half of them are girls, or 26 of them, or whatever. There's no girl deficit when it comes to math. It's, it's, it's bullshit. So, you know, but they have to have the confidence. They have to have the, the, and they have to have the training. You know, if you don't, if you can't speak the language, you're stopped. That's it. You don't develop. Okay, so I think, um, like you were saying, the contextualization. I think that has to happen earlier. Um, and we can think about how we um, give kids skills and how we have them practice those skills. But having them having them practice those skills in the context of real world jobs, for example. And so instead of me writing out million formulas and just memorizing what they are. How, how are those formulas used in everyday jobs? I think that's the first piece and that happening very soon. Um, I think the other thing is just broadening students' exposure. Um, and you know, part of it is, like I said, people just don't have an idea of what the different types of engineering um, fields are and how they can see themselves in those areas. And so to get more kids to have that aha moment, you have to expose them to a wide variety of things that are going on. Yeah. And in terms of that kind of interdisciplinary cross-curricularity, um, Northern Ireland, again, is, is really well ahead of the UK and Ireland in this. At, in the primary school curriculum, every child has to create a cross-curricular project, and they can do it under a communications or a using ICT heading. It's generally a creative project, whether it's a film or a website or a comic book, a digital story, a, a podcast, a radio show, what, whatever it is. <laughs> and the teacher, the, the key to this is, is that, that it's context, it's purpose. You know, if, if a teacher has a reason to do this, they're going to be accredited on the strength of it, then they'll throw the kitchen sink at it. And some of the quality of work that's being produced in primary schools because of that cross-curricular model, it may be, um, you know, filming a science experiment or um, creating animations about a, a Celtic hero figure in, in local history or, or whatever it would be um, and that's really hardened skills across all of the primary school curriculum but in in the northern system as here once you get into the secondary school cross-curricular room is, is restricted everybody's in their own subject silo they're being judged on that and we haven't been able to crack it in the northern curriculum yet it's been piloted in the northern curriculum the teachers uprose in rebellion and, and the pilot's likely to be cancelled now um, so it's it's very challenging and you know it's it's big structural building blocks in education w one key thing in our work at the nerve center it's all funded by the department of culture arts and leisure our schools work with all of those teachers is, is, is not funded by the department of education the department of education is a a slow-moving beast that's very, very difficult to, to affect change in. Um, so our work has come through the Department of Culture. I don't know if there's any lessons for that in the Republic. Mm -hmm. Let me just pass the mic on here. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm principal of a secondary school. I'm very interested in your in you saying about the um, need for the modelling, but that's only going to come from our teachers. How would you suggest that we expose our teachers really to STEM? Because that is the difficulty. And in a previous session, um, I know Bianca spoke about, you know, her the lack of opportunity to go out and see what's happening in other schools. There's equally the, the lack of opportunity to see what's happening in industry. And I feel that that's particularly the greatest challenge. And how would you suggest that the system should address that? Shake it up, we'll start with John. <laughs> well, I think well, the, one of the first things in, in terms of the teacher conversation is that teachers aren't judged on their ability to prepare a workforce fit for the modern economy. Schools are, the education system is, but teachers as individuals aren't, so that the change has to be systemic at a higher level. Teachers are judged on their ability to produce academic results in their students. Um, and that's that's their priority. Trying to fit anything else in around that is very challenging. Our work with teachers in Northern Ireland is done almost entirely 
on a voluntary basis by teachers. There used to be, you know, five or six years ago, you, you would have a budget to pay for substitution cover to get teachers out for, for CPD. That's gone. There is, there is that. So a lot of our work is done on twilights or on weekends. And the respect that we would have as an organization for the teaching profession, I don't think teachers get an awful raw deal because they have long holidays and supposedly short working days. Um, but I don't know many other professions where on across the whole profession people give up so much of their free time for professional development that sometimes their school principals aren't even aware that they're doing it. It's challenging and it relies on teachers having the, the, the flexibility to do that and there's, there's no easy solution that we've been able to come up with apart from resources which just aren't there. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things I'm starting to see are um, teacher internships within industry. So basically taking some of your summer and going to actually um, co-locate within um, a company that maybe relates to what you're teaching um, and really understanding kind of what the skill sets you're teaching and how that relates to um, what's happening in that company. Um, also, as I mentioned, this this NEPRIS platform that we invested in, um, which is connecting the industry profession professionals into the classroom, we're seeing it actually being used um, for PD as well, where teachers are asking, having conversations with an industry expert and saying, my, my students are working on this project, how do you think I can better coach them or how do you think I can better evaluate these projects? And so I think just opening more conversations between these industry experts um, and teachers as, as a first step. And, and I think you're hitting upon a challenge, uh, which is about capacity building, you know, at, at, at every level, you know, and I think that's a challenge. And there's no doubt that industry has a part to play. We recognize that in helping to inject some of that capacity and provide more of those opportunities. But it's, it's a reflection as well, just a, just a brief reflection on the teaching profession itself. One of the biggest challenges we have is finding really good maths and science teachers and attracting them to the profession. What I don't see, which really amazes me, you know, I'm in Microsoft 19 years, I've had more than 20 jobs. You know, I've run media services, I've done program management, I've done a variety of things. I don't see any mobility in teaching. I see people enter the teaching profession as a teacher of, as I did, and exit it as a teacher of. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare to see, you know, let, let's, let's be honest, they, they, these are people with the skills, you know, to be great pedagogues, but we're not attracting them to perhaps the disciplines which most need that. So I think that's something perhaps we should look at, you know, to, to, to recruit internally and, and encourage people with the skills in teaching to champion those subjects. I think uh, in some STEM fields it's actually impossible to keep up with the the pace of the development uh, completely. So, like people have talked about Ireland, you know, doing coding uh, classes. Well, what's the latest coding platform? How can the teacher possibly keep up? Yeah. You know, when they they learn COBOL, right, and then they work their way to Fortran, and then and then they got lost at C and they never got onto object-oriented programming at all. Uh, so they can't actually keep up with the kids. And in some ways, that's okay. Why is that okay? Because you know we've learned from the Coder Dojo model that you, the teacher needs to be a facilitator, and the world's best teachers are available online. You can get them. You know they uh, they're on YouTube. They're they're you know there's some software that'll allow you to have access to it. So the teacher adapts the role of a facilitator. You know I, I guess a few years ago Ireland's discovered that that 60 percent of their 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 I was it primary or secondary, I can't remember, teachers uh, weren't qualified to teach maths. I, I should say 60% of their maths teachers weren't qualified to teach maths. Um, so, uh, you know, that's improved. I think it's now 40% or something. It's improved dramatically. That's a huge improvement. But we don't need to be stuck in the old century. We can actually use, you know, online tools, Khan Academy, uh, you know, the world's best teachers. Are, um, the, the the material is all there, you know, download it from, you know, X website, slideshare.net or whatever. So I think um, that's the challenge is to have the tools that the teachers need to have to monitor the progress of their students even though they don't, the, the students themselves are teaching each other. Perfect, thank you. There's a lady down the back there. Stay there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, is the STEM challenge actually bigger than we really realize? And it may partially explain why we have children who feel that they're not particularly good at maths <coughs> or, and science, and why we may not have teachers that we feel are fully competent in that area. I had a sleepless night last night. I credit everybody that I stayed awake today because <laughs> I had a very sleepless night. But I, as I do if I have a sleepless night, I turn on the radio and I listen to Pat Kenny's show on News Talk. And every week he does a science slot. And he has a professor of uh, 
biochemistry or something from Trinity, you, usually very good. I didn't catch it all, but what was very interesting is as a result of research that they've been doing on twins for over 50 or 60 years, 10,000 sets of twins, they are now of the opinion that when it comes to maths, that 75% is nature and 25% is nurture. And that is evidence-based research. Interestingly, the other subject, and I would always see a strong affiliation between the two, where that correlation also exists, is music. That only 25% is uh, basically nurtured. The rest is actually innate. When it comes to subjects like English languages, it's 50-50, apparently. So I think that's a huge challenge for us as mm -hmm. educators. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, th that research, uh, I mean, one thing I will do later tonight is I will go back and podcast that whole slot mm -hmm. because I don't think I captured it all. But I think it's very interesting and I think it throws a new dimension as to how we have to think about today and <coughs> how we... Well, the, the real challenge around STEM. Yeah, certainly food for thought. Thank you for that. We'll maybe take a question. Look, bear in mind, we've only 10 minutes left here. So. Um, I'm just wondering also, are we a little bit hung up on the school system and teachers and the way that this all has to be conveyed? Because, for example, I think certainly in Ireland, a lot of parents still end up spending quite a lot of time helping their kids with their homework. And I must say, hearing a kid moving on to project maths when, for example, you've done the old fashioned fractions and everything is a bit of a challenge. So that would be one point. Like, how do you keep the parents up to speed enough to help the kids with the homework? Mm -hmm. Or else do you have to set up a whole new system of homework clubs or something like that for these kind of subjects? And also then coming to the challenge of the summer holidays when you've got, you know, basically three months of the summer where kids, you know, don't have school. Is there any ways of running camps or something in these subjects? So maybe moving outside the curriculum and being maybe a bit more imaginative. Okay. Okay. I love that idea. I love that idea of running maths clubs for, for parents. Speaking as one of those parents who gets asked to sit down, I have six kids, so I get asked a lot to sit down and help them with their homework. I'm confronted with my ignorance daily, you know, and, and I do my best and I do study because I think we all are lifelong learners. But the notion of having a, a support system specifically for parents, recognizing their primary role, not only in providing some of that instruction, but also in building that confidence among their kids is, is really an intriguing one. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else like to come that? Yeah, come ahead, John. Uh, well, first of all, I'd say on the the, the summer camps, Ro Roshin here is one of the facilitators. Runs those camps in in, in Derry. Summer steam because we've more time <laughs> and we can do more art. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Roshin. But it's STEM in the classroom. So. Roshin can maybe tell you a bit about those as well because they're very successful. And on the parental engagement, it's one we challenge or we struggle with because we're funded, as I said, by the Department of Culture and social inclusion is a huge part of the agenda of what we're trying to do. Evidentially and anecdotally, the engaged parents who you can reach with training are often not the parents of the, the, the children in the, the, the most um, economic um, disadvantage. It's very difficult to, to try and strike a balance between giving parents the support and resources they need and not further disadvantaging people whose parents aren't engaged around it. We, we struggle with it very deeply. Um, I'm involved in running a Coda Dojo, as, uh, as uh, Kerry had said earlier on. One of the issues we've had around that model, we support Coda Dojos in Northern Ireland through the, the Nerve Centres Creative Learning Centres, um, but the parental um, escort mode makes it very, very difficult for single parents and parents of multiple children of similar ages to be able to engage. It's not impossible, but it requires a, a, pa a parent who's really committed to, to their child's learning doing that. So it's hard to get that balance between you know, get letting the, 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 the more beneficial or the more advantaged students increase that gap and, and trying to bring some people along further down the spectrum as well. And any solutions will be gladly heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have time for more questions. It's actually just a comment added on to what you said there. Um, I was at the Future Jobs Forum recently in Sue Black Smoke, and in the UK they have this initiative called Tech Moms, which is a bit like Code Dojo for mums. And they ran a scheme in a disadvantaged area in London, 
and they had a very high uptake and it's something they're looking to now roll into Ireland. I think that's potentially an opportunity outside the education system where you can get parents involved and that purpose is slightly different is to get mums just comfortable with technology as a starting point but it's a beginning to maybe a, a bigger conversation. Perfect. Have we any more? Or, yep, perfect. Just one more comment. Um, my name is Lisa Rutledge, just a shameless plug on the, the summer courses. I'm running a course called the Think Academy, which is a, a summer maths project to get students kind of engaged and excited about maths and driving themselves essentially in their maths education. And on the point there actually about parental engagement, it's something that's mentioned a lot and certainly my parents had a huge impact on, I'm currently doing a PhD in engineering, but my parents had a huge impact on developing my confidence in, in maths and me wanting to drive myself in that direction. So as part of our project, we see the parents as having a huge role in the education of, of young people. So as part of that, the uh, one of the, the aspects of the summer course is that students will actually present an idea or explain an idea as simply as they possibly can, because as you're probably aware, many of you as educators, in order to explain something very well, you have to have a very solid understanding of it yourself. So the students essentially develop their own understanding of a concept um, and then explain it to the parents in the most fun, most imaginative, creative way they possibly can. And the parents have actually found this, first of all, it's actually breaking down that barrier of, you know, parents feeling, well, I'm no good at maths, so oh, I'll stay clear of you when, while you're doing your maths homework, because there's plenty of parents here that maybe bring their kids to Irish dancing or to football training on a Saturday morning, yet they may not be the Michael Flatley or whatever else of, mm -hmm. of whatever that field is so you can have an involvement in your in your child's maths education whether you're a maths whiz or not um, and it can actually have it's very difficult it's an you know immeasurable the impact that, that can have on on kids so i think parents definitely can have a huge role in it brilliant thank you for that and um, we have time yeah there's another question actually a comment, a comment. addressing john's question <laughs> John, um, I, I, I think you have a very good point there, and that's that's a huge in education, is how do you bring those kids that are being left behind, that they don't have the support network at home, and, and you know they don't have role models. Uh, I would just like, since you said you're open to ideas, uh, two things. One is Ken Robinson's perspective that learning, uh, for some reason, somebody decided that learning is an individual activity while you're preparing for a social role in society at a later stage. So so his, his point is, you know, that, you know, it, it's it, uh, project-based learning, as you said also, but team project-based learning, I think it's a very good way to do that. We're talking about peer support, where the other support doesn't exist somewhere else. The Khan Academy is addressing that in a very interesting way, because they measure, they give teacher information, look, these kids are excelling in your class and these kids are lagging behind. Team them up. Yeah. Get the, 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 the best uh, performing students in your class to be the role models, to be the guides for the guys that are being left behind. I think I would have a look at that. I think it's a very interesting way of dealing with it. It's one of those things where you, then, Thank you. you may have parental engagement then but in a negative way because the parents, if the children say, well, so they're going to be penalized by having to carry some, some dead weight with them or bring something mm. with them. Reward them. Reward them. Mm. Come academy. Badges. Mm. You know, social yeah. leader, you know, guru at something. And let them enforce this social status. Let them benefit from it. And introduce gamification. Fantastic. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that. And we'll have time for one more question or comment, and then we'll ask the panelists maybe to round up and maybe try to include the entrepreneurship, which has been a bit neglected in this <laughs> panel. <laughs> yeah. Now it's my chance to plug entrepreneurship. Maria Doherty and I work with um, Feroiga, which is a youth organisation. First of all, to, uh, to say to John, we run Coder Dojo clubs for young people who are coming from underserved areas and who, who are, are from challenging communities. And how we do that is our, our youth work workers are all guard vetted. They would be familiar with them so they can come into the centre and the, the trainers are there. Um, also, just in terms of, of entrepreneurship, we, we have a, um, an entrepreneurship program called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. It's um, um, originated in America and it's run in 27 counties in Ireland, Belfast being the 27th. You know what the other 26 are. And um, we work with 1,500 young people, um, not exclusively in disadvantaged communities, but a lot of the time. And it's given them those core skills around entrepreneurship, which is setting up your own business. Um, we have our own curriculum. We have two days training for teachers 
teachers that we train, we train teachers, youth workers, volunteers, anybody to, who's interested. And some of the teachers we have trained have said it's the best training program they've done in 10 years because it's, it's interactive, it's participative, it's, it's applied learning. And through the whole conversation today, I've yet to hear the role that non-formal education can play because that's what we're doing. We are actually giving young people all those soft skills. We have programs in leadership, citizenship, health and well-being, and they're evidence-based and they're outcome-focused. And we're, it's there. It's sitting there. It's ready to go. We work. We do work with industry. Our entrepreneurship program would partner with all of the big companies, including Microsoft. We had a four-day summer camp last year in Microsoft for young people. There was 20 young people there from lots of different parts of Ireland, rural parts, who would never have had an opportunity to, to be in Microsoft. So at 16, 17, 18, they've been in a company for four days that they owned. They did own it. They were in the canteen, they were in the breakout rooms, you had your employees coming in and giving them sessions. And they now say, you know what? I could come here and I could come here and work. And I said that to one of the kids and towards the end of the said, you know, I could come back here and run this company, which is true. That's what you want them to 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 to, um, to think and to believe. So I just wanted to sort of um, give a sense of, of some of the great work that's going on out there. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that contribution. OK, so I think um, bearing in mind that we have to be out of here very sharp. <laughs> we have about maybe five minutes each for each of the panelists, maybe to round up what their thoughts on the area the, of the contributions that have been made and that's here okay sure so sure. I, I just like to I, I'm not quite sure you know I'm slow at some things I'm not quite sure what entrepreneurship is at the primary level um, I think certainly we can have in our curriculums great uh, games uh, for learning how businesses run um, there's a great little app uh, that teaches math, by the way, on the iPad called Pizza. Um, and you run a pizza shop, you price the pieces of different values, and you run out of business or you don't. And my daughter loves it. Is that teaching entrepreneurship? I guess so. Um, but, and, and it's teaching math. You know, um, what, I, you know, where I think entrepreneurship, the way I think of entrepreneurship uh, is, is the best place to teach entrepreneurship is, is really at the point that you're actually doing it, um, uh, where it matters um, rather than uh, too early. Where I think, um, you know, so, so basically at the college level, at the accelerator level, that's where I think entrepreneurship training, what I would call uh, entrepreneurship training, is, is best suited. What I think should be taught at a primary and secondary level um, are all the things that are necessary for an entrepreneur to succeed. So uh, what does it take for an entrepreneur to be successful? Well, they need to be, they need to be, you know, uh, highly, uh, you know, it needs to be about responsibility, it needs to be about service, it needs to be about honesty, it needs to be about reliability. These are basically cultural values that we should be teaching our children you know, cultural values as to what it makes makes a good entrepreneur. Uh, to teach them, you know, how to do balance sheets and things like that, um, you know, they're going to forget that if they learn it in third grade and then they have to do it uh, again when they're actually running the, the, the balance sheets. So let's, so, so to me, it's the cultural values that need to be, you know, not being afraid of failure, you know, try, try, try again. You know, all those things is what we need to drill into our kids. You know, it's of course it's a parent's first responsibility to do that, but it, but it's the school, the school can help greatly, and that's to me is what entrepreneurship teaching should be like at the primary level. About that service, uh, you know, about being of service to people. That's what creates a great entrepreneur. So, so I don't quite get. I, I still don't understand it quite, but I, I'm open and I'm listening for what. Why I, th you know, because if we're going to spend so much time at teaching entrepreneurship at the primary level, is that going to take us away from teaching, you know, arts and math and, and things like that? Um, I, I actually would spend the time teaching how our kids how to be better humans. And I, I think there's, at the base of this is a question about capacity. We're clearly just not doing a good enough job. I think we need to recognize it. I need to recognize the failures both within the system but also within the support systems, whether they're formal or informal, and figure out what the interventions should be. You know, get the get the kids involved as well. Though let's let's not forget this. We've had a long discussion about parental involvement. We've had a discussion about the school system, about teacher uh, professional development. 
the kids are already interested in these subjects, and I think that that's something that's been hidden. You know, they they just need the opportunity, and if we can help to re-engineer curricular opportunities, and and also just to cite one danger, to make sure we don't introduce another set of labels and silos which operate in the same way as the old ones. You know, that STEM doesn't become known in the way that maths was known as something that's not for me. You know, then then there's real optimism because I think that the systems themselves are changing in a way that can only support growth in this area. So I think. Um I almost don't like putting the E in front of STEM, just like you don't like the A. Um, I think all of all of our education should be entrepreneurial, and we should be teaching kids how to be, have an entrepreneurial mindset. And it's not necessarily about that necessary um, that category or that um, that core subject. Um, so, what does that look like? So, you touched on it a bit. That looks like um, having opportunities for kids to fail. What do they learn from failure? How do they persist? Um, it's teaching grit at the earliest ages. It's not necessarily the balance sheets. So uh, as an investor, I see entrepreneurs every day. Uh, and I'm not judging them based on how well their ban balance sheet is. I'm not judging them on their, their model. They're a little bit on their business model. Um, but I, I'm judging them from, um, you know, as a person and as an entrepreneur, do they have the qualities that it's going to take? Uh, and those qualities, like I said, are persistence. Do they have the passion? Um, do they, did they do user-centered design? Did they, you know, lock themselves in a room and try to build something? Or did they learn how to go out and talk to their customers and do the customer validation and do um, the kind of the user-centered design pieces? So I think that should just be embedded in everything that we teach and is not a separate core subject. Um, we, coming from the kind of community arts sector originally, entrepreneurship was always a, a dirty word to us, a, a concept, you know, dirty capitalism, money, cash, we're <laughs> hippie, lefty beatniks here, we don't want to do any of that. Fab, Fab Labs changed that for us slightly because previously people were making virtual products, songs, um, films, uh, websites, whatever, now, that, now they're making physical objects which have you know, sales potential, have business idea potential, can be sold, can be components for machines or whatever. So we've only recently started dipping our toe in, in the kind of entrepreneurship training. What we would have done previously, would if, if somebody came through a, a digital program, had an idea, we would refer them on to Invest Northern Ireland or the, the local entrepreneurial support agencies. Um, and we're, we're struggling to an extent with it because particularly with our sort of inclusion agenda on, on, on the, the sort of the, the, the learners that are coming from a very low base, um, trying to instill a, a sense of, of entrepreneurship and, and develop this into business ideas. It's, it's more about confidence and actual, what I talked about before, pr professional skills to be part of a modern workforce around punctuality, presentation, communication, reliability, and, and all of that. Um, so it, it's an evolving piece of work for us around entrepreneurship, but certainly um, we've had concrete examples come through already as, a, as a, a, a young woman in Derry who now runs a business called Peacemakers making mm -hmm. um, fridge magnets which are based on local landmarks that are laser cut that she came through the Fab Lab program, learned how to design, learned how to use a laser cutter, has now bought her own laser cutter, has had support from Invest and, and, and that's been our first kind of case study going into developing an idea. Somebody came in off the street as an open session and now is to generating a living as a business, but we have plenty more to learn, um, and we're keen to we're listening and keen to take guidance and advice on how we can make entrepreneurship part of what we do, and, and probably change our own culture around that a little. I, w I would say too that that, that that notion that we have, I think, is shared with an awful lot of teachers that we work with. Teachers on the ground probably don't see entrepreneurship skills as something. That your, your average history teacher, your average chemistry teacher, I don't think really sees entrepreneurship skills as something that it's their responsibility to do, and that they wouldn't feel that they have the skills to do it either. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll just put a hand together for the panelists there. Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, I'm just going to pass on to Roshan here before. Uh, a closing statement, so go ahead, Rashid. A, a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Not about my business, whatever, but it's about we're the three of us from the north that went on the EdTech STEM trip. We have um, since we've met each other, we have been collaborating and uh, Belfast, Tyrone, and Derry. So we have managed uh, the US Embassy kindly offered your good selves or some of you to the north. So we snatched you up to Derry. So we're having a brilliant conference tomorrow, much the same as this. Um, and we look forward to having you. And uh, just a plug on there, we chatted about. Fab Lab, Summer STEM, Summer STEAM, and um, and even the EdTech for Mums, we kind of run a program like that as well. And 
we're, we're getting there and I, I'm loving hearing all of the information today and even when we were in America and um, you know I'm not saying that dairy is ahead of everywhere else but you know what we're taking a lot of boxes but we have a lot to learn um, and if you wanted to know more um, I'm sure we'll be able to swap yeah. details and stuff of successful programs and programs that we have to, to learn from and um, thank you thank yeah. you thank you Rashi. So this has been a fantastic discussion, thanks to the panellists, and I think it's worth noting, obviously, between the panel we have Northern Ireland, we've got the Republic of Ireland, we've got the US, so we have a lot to learn from each other, we have some similar problems, we've maybe tackled it in different ways, so I think there's a real opportunity for collaboration and obviously learning from each other, and it's really looking forward to seeing where this area is going to be going over the next few years, so thank you all for coming, and if, yeah, and we just want to close by saying that the Francois Pinars talk is on at 4 or 4 and first of all folks I'd like to, yeah. to say thank you to the uh, team here this is a uh, steam without the s right Roisin Gareth and uh, <laughs> Harry <laughs> uh, for putting a good program together today. to our panelists Sean Stephen Chantal and uh, John thank you very much